am super excited to introduce our main speaker today. So Sebastian Moreno Vaca of A2M was a founding member of A2M and leads the firm's regenerative design for a decarbonized future. And since starting A2M in 2000, Sebastian led it to international recognition through his knowledge building and sustainable practices and his long tenure as the president of the board of the Belgian Passive House Association. Since 2006, he's also been teaching architecture at ULB University in Brussels. In 2009, he co-founded and edited the magazine that maybe some of you guys have seen called Be Passive. And A2M, his firm is headquartered in Brussels and has offices in Lisbon and in New York through its sister company, M2A. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, Beverly. Um, okay, I'm gonna start. So as you can tell, um, I'm really far from uh, being a English native speaker, but I'll do my best, of course. Um, I'm start sharing the screen. I hope it's working now. Okay, so let's start. Uh, I'm going to present you a couple of slides of two retrofit or renovation, or I don't know how you can call. One is uh, how we are doing now a retrofit from a former office building to residential on a large scale. It's here in Europe. The second one, it's a retrofit of a very iconic building from the 60s, uh, but you will see. First, a, a very tiny introduction. Yeah, this is thanks to Roger Waters, you know, from Pink Floyd. Um, so we, we are coming from, uh, Beverly mentioned it briefly. Um, Zach, too, is, we are coming from a country where Passive House is, is in the code since uh, eight years now. So today, whether you like it or not, are you against or for any kind of scale of destination, whatever it is, new build or retrofit must achieve Passive House criteria since, yeah. 2015. So that's in the code anymore. So there's no more certification because it's it's a it's a local law. Okay. And if you don't like it, you have to build on another on another country, another place. But okay, fine. Um, and in all that, because we we are just an architect firm, uh, we are approximately 45 people, uh, split in three in three location, as Beverly mentioned. But we do all kind of projects, a lot of design and build with builder. Sometimes result build and, and finance. Uh, the only thing is, as architect, we have in sources since a long time ago, actually since 2003, so we're very old, uh, all this knowledge about building physics, uh, et cetera, passive house, et cetera. And we decided in 2007 that we will do only but passive house 100% or we do nothing. Hopefully, it was still there, so the or nothing didn't happen. <laughs> but it's all kind of destination, as I explained, new, uh, new build or you know, or retrofit, uh, large scale, small scale, um, school, housing, office, affordable housing. Uh, since years, very long time ago, we, we do a lot of trainings, conference, uh, sometimes masterclass in some uh, universities here and there. Um, together with, with Sean Santamo, we did that huge uh, event. It was called the Ice Challenge, which was a crazy impact. That was in New York, but that's New York, and he continue all over the U.S. So we have spread a bit all over. Uh, one of the things is uh, when Passive House became the code in our country, uh, we, we were already going beyond, and we discovered that actually to do a Passive House is not the goal, absolutely not. It's just a tiny or a huge one first step, but you can go way more beyond. And as soon as the market starts to distress, where passive house is just no big deal. That's just nothing. Just just a building. Who cares? Of course, your energy bill is going to be reduced uh, uh, of more than the ninety percent. Huh? If you have an apartment, your heating cost is going to be uh, as much as as, as you start back a month. If you are in New York or maybe in Seattle, it's a bit more cold, but whatever. So this is we discovered that is it's very easy to go way more beyond and very very fast. Otherwise, it would have been boring. We discovered that why don't we try to do project that will regenerate the environment and not only just limit your impact, but can you do development that if you don't do it, it's worse for the climate, it's worse for the planet, worse for the environment. So can we go that far? And in between, we had the COVID and, and the second crisis, which is going on with the war here in Europe, um, has shown us that really uh, <laughs> it's a direction that you know cannot come back. So one of the things that when we have integrated all these skills and knowledge about building physics now we use that even we play with this algorithm in grasshopper so it's parametric design so all the dynamic simulation we start always with uh, 
with the static calculation of PHPP, of course, but all the rest is used and we take the result in dynamic simulation. It's kind of a loop of iterative loop that is, is now even reverse, not only to make a survey or to test are we passive house, are we okay? Is gonna building be going to be comfortable, but it's we reverse everything and we use all these tools, actually that we, we still to engineers uh, to produce buildings or sexy narrative. So here it's all about two um, typical rehab because it's most of the story of uh, most of Europe. Some buildings are a thousand years old, so you can imagine. And uh, because Europe won't be uh, one of the first uh, CO2 neutral continent in the world, uh, we have no way to achieve it, but fine. Um, it's all about rehab really mostly. Um, so one of the one of the process we do, because sometimes you start with an existing fabric, an existing building, and it's not that easy to go uh, to a 475 EBTU or even to zero energy or even to be self-sufficient because that's something new. We do now projects that are completely unplugged. Uh, yeah, self-sufficient, not only in energy, but in water. That's going to be another talk another time. So what we do, we do a kind of a, a sort of a roadmap with uh, typically some step-by-step uh, -step, uh, uh, zone that we're going to we're gonna work with. And to see that wherever you stop, we can continue Whenever you want, the idea is this, as soon as you change an element of the building, whether it is a house or, or a high rise, we don't care. The idea is that you don't have to change it anymore for a hundred years, please. There's the lack of resources now. Uh, so the idea is if you need a triple pane glazing to achieve one day a passive house or to be one day self-sufficient, you do it. If you can't pay it, please don't install uh, just a stupid double pane glazing that's going to mortgage your, your project. So this is typically how we work with this kind of kind of roadmaps, how to be from zero to be one day completely self-sufficient, from existing to one day self-sufficient. You stop where we can with investment and we continue when we can. So that's the minimum. In, in uh, renovation or, or retrofit, there is mainly two big families of uh, retrofit because it's all about envelope. Envelope design, this is why uh, architects should be uh, what we do. Uh, and without engineers, we should do it all in-house. So whether you can remove the existing envelope, which is some project you can do that, and some project you have to keep the existing envelope. On the first one, if you can remove the envelope, it's like a new build, so there's no big deal. That's just like a regular building. If you have to keep the envelope, you have the choice to insulate from the inside or from the outside. If it's from the outside, you cool from the inside, Sometimes you have to do it, especially with landmark. In England, we would say listed building, but it's landmark that you cannot touch, etc. cetera. Um, here, we're going to present to uh, you a kind of, uh, it's an in-between where we had to keep slab and bearing walls or bearing structure from the 60s because it's iconic, as I say. It's a landmark, so it's not that you can change it or remove it. There's no way. So I'm going to present you two extremes, the one on the left and the one on the right. Of course, you have all kind of situation, all, all kind of scales. The, so the very first one is here on the left. It's a project from late 80s. Um, we just uh, have done now the building permit. So we are going to uh, to the building, actually. It's a pretty minute, it's a large scale, you will see. It's a, a bit more than 200 square feet. Uh, and the second one, it's a, it's a bank. It's a huge bank uh, from uh, ING Bank. It's a group from uh, Holland, and they... The idea is to retrofit. We are in construction now, a building from the 60s, you will see. Uh, it's a very, very large one. It's a half million square feet. Um, so the first one, the office building is going to be changed into a residential. The idea is, of course, because everyone who built or retrofit, whatever you do, no matter what, can be any kind of destination in our country. It's passive house. What are you going to offer more? So now it's very easy to to do uh, and to go beyond to not only zero energy, that makes sense, we want to pay, we want to pay a bill to, for en energy, please, but to go to CO2 neutral, that's the minimum. So here you don't have even to convince developers or yourself, you just do it, that, that makes sense. So the building is here, it's a building from the, as I said, from late uh, 80s, it's uh, uh, an institutional building. Uh, Brussels, it's a bit like Washington DC, we have all the European institutions and they are here. And uh, they are on the suburb of the city. Um, it's a pretty minute large scale. And they're going to quit the building uh, this year. So we're going to start the work next year. So the idea is we had uh, 
more than 20 kbtu and we're going to achieve 3.5 just a bit less than 4.75 uh, of course so you see so that's the building i'm not going to uh, take your time with all concept and why and, and and so forth but the idea is that it's the building in the 80s it was all about cars so you have like i don't know 300 cars in, in the underground which is crazy so we reactivate part of the underground to put uh, uh, like a fitness center so or, or typically what you have when you have communities like co-livings and so on but th that's just for for the fun um, the idea is we always start here with, with the existing fabric and structure but uh, nowadays, and it was nice that COVID passed, well, not for some reason, but some yes, is that everyone want to have 100% uh, outdoor uh, spaces, whether it is affordable housing, residential, high-end uh, condos, office building, everyone want to work outside, they live outside, even if it's freezing like hell or the, the, or the contrary with heat waves. So the idea is it's very easy to integrate terraces in the existing structure, but you have to remove the former curtain wall. The thing is, because of the structure, we have beams on the facade, and it's not possible to hang um, terraces on the outside without removing all the interior slab, which is which is insane. So what we propose, instead of doing that, which sometimes it's possible, but here it's crazy, we said, look, why don't we add kind of, a, of exoskelet, a bit like an Iron Man, you know, <laughs> a very performant Iron Man, uh, along all the building to, to have the possibility to put as many um, facilities as we want. Could be uh, low just bow window, uh, greenery, trees, terraces, vid, whatever kind. Then we create a kind of a, a ring along uh, all around all the building with activated zone. So that was the, the former building. That's the, the, the crown, I would say, all around the building that is activated. Uh, and we increase by that uh, maybe 15%, 30% of the, the surface that you're going to put on the market for the developer, it's fantastic. So that was the former building, how it was since uh, 1988. And this is how it's going to be split in different uh, apartments. Okay, so that, that is the existing, and this is how it's going to be, uh, let's say, in two years. Again, here, how it is today. The former one, which is on the left, it's another famous architect in Belgium who retrofit an office building into housing, so into dwellings. So this is how it's going to be. Um, again, here's on the left. We are in resident, residential uh, suburb, I would say. So it's really how to reactivate not only the envelope, but also the, as I said here, the, the basement, et cetera, et cetera. So apart from that, a bit of uh, building physics, two, two slides, I'm not going to bother you with that. Uh, but one of the things is the way structure were done in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they are very poor in structure. So it's not that you can add extra load and so on. So that's design pH. Uh, so we used to work with panelized system that you used to in the US, all over the US, in Canada, which is cool. In Europe, part of Europe can do that, but part cannot. So we are in a zone where it's complicated, but nevertheless, we, we can do that. It has to be fire resistant and so on. So you just plug um, extra... Um, Panelized system, we did that here on a high rise. It's over since a few years already. So it's very easy um, to clad and to bring a completely very high end um, envelope. We are talking about an R value, uh, just a bit more than R50. Triple pen glazing, uh, when the market starts calming down here, we can find now triple glazing at the cost of a double glazing that you could find in any stupid shop at in any corner. So now it's just it's it's nothing. You see, it's yeah, it's triple plane. Yeah, so what? With, with with help for the cost, because again, all these buildings, the idea is to do a retrofit at the same cost than if it was a business as usual. It means like a stupid renovation, but it's going to be a bit more than passive house. That's a high rise, just to give you an idea how it was. Um, and then we add some extra floors. Then, um, and the funny thing is uh, in circularity, reuse, that's something was just fun or for, uh, let's say, uh, for, for, to save the planet or whatever a few years ago. And actually just a bit before war started and it happened at the end of the first two years of COVID, we had in Europe a huge lack of wood. There were no more wood available in all over Europe and every builder accelerated that lack of resources by try to store as much as you can wood. <laughs> so it was completely crazy. You could, you could not even, even in, 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 in markets, in supermarket, you could not find any wood in, in all over Europe. It was crazy. So this is kind of uh, going to reuse of material. It helps also in a world that we were in a finite world. 
it was not as much as in the US where we think everything is infinite and it's going to be forever. Here we face a bit faster than foreseen, lack of everything, steel, aluminium, steel cost like 300% of uh, the cost. It was uh, three years ago or two years ago, same for aluminium, gas explodes, so it's crazy to produce glass. So everything comes to an end very much faster than foreseen. So here, that's a new way of doing a slab with a, you, you, you recompose a floor. It's kerto, it's a kind of multi-layer. And we install that into steel. Um, so you see here, the, that's a survey of some of our uh, European Code Institute that for years we had no really extra cost. And here it exploded and since, uh, so Putin came here, like in February here, and it accelerated the, yeah, <laughs> the end of resources. You So now you have to go to reuse. This is the steel, that's the aluminum cost. So it's really uh, complicated. And reuse was already done for... Uh, finishing or interior, like carpets, I don't know, flooring. But what is very new, and that's the first in Europe, I mean, in our continent, is to use a bearing structure that we could find on another country in St. Holland, in the Netherlands. Uh, so you need some special test to reuse them and so on because you have to be fire resistant, etc. So this is completely reused. And actually, the builder could buy the steel at uh, 40% of the cost uh, compared if you would have buy it to ArcelorMittal or one of the big uh, international uh, steel producer. So that's the idea. So for if when the building is going to be over, like in two years, um, we're going to have a kind of CO2 reduction of uh, approximately 50% compared to uh, his life. He was today. It included all. We calculate that on 60 years. There is a code that's coming from England, if they're not part of Europe, that when you calculate CO2 neutrality, you have to take into account 60 years of uh, of uh, running uh, cost and running uh, emission uh, yearly, plus the the change, the life cycle of all the materials, etc. So we calculated that this is the building at the scale of uh, yeah in, in the master plan in that part of the city. So the savings because we change it to a, a bit more than a passive house. It's uh, close to zero energy. It's as, as much as close to 200 tons equivalent of CO2. That means nothing, but it's equivalent to a park the size of almost 90 acres, which is in our country or in our city, it's like uh, three times the King's Park if it was a forest that size that we're going to save per year. So the second one, it's a uh, very uh, iconic uh, retrofit, which is running. The one I said is a half million square feet. And here, it's a very, very complicated project to retrofit. It's the bank. Um, I don't know if someone in the audience know who is this guy here uh, smoking here. That's really back in the days. Well, you don't have to answer. But this is a Gordon Bunshaft, uh, the famous Gordon Bunshaft from SOM in the 60s. Just after he did some uh, very iconic building like Chase Manhattan Bank in New York, here the Yale's Banker Library and so on, he was one of the first to use this uh, bearing structure on the outside and to make the, the design of the building. So he did this building, that's a picture took um, in 1964, precisely. You see that with the car, we, we are like in a movie like Flint or James Bond, you see it's very fantastic. So he did a fantastic building in, in Brussels for the bank, so they're still there. It's, it's an an amazing project. So you see, so it's it's still today one of the most modern building ever, most iconic. So the idea is to completely retrofit it, not only to passive house because that's nothing. Okay, you just put insulation and so on. But how do you manage all these miles of uh, thermal bridge, etc.? And is it possible to go to sea neutral, etc.? So if I ask, it means of course that we can. But you see, we had an, an, an heating demand which was like a uh, huge. Uh, 32 kbtu and we're going to be part is going to be beyond 475 and some are going to be five you will see so th this is the building today so the building of the 60s is the the main one on the we are in the city center the king's palace because we have a king my god uh, <laughs> is here so he's facing the king actually and they did an extension in the uh, beginning of the 90s and that was so again so some came back and they make a mirror of, of, of the former iconic, fantastic building. So that's the building of the 60s, the one of the 90s. But today there is a lot of, of um, well, misuse of this one is not that transparent anymore. For, there is a lot of things. It was an international competition. So we propose, okay, we're gonna try to bring Bunshaft to not only passive up, but to zero 
no more impact. And also to try to bring light in these very deep buildings, which is which is a problem. Sometimes we, we see that in New York, when you have to retrofit office to residential, it's too deep, it's not that easy. So it's one of the cases here. And it was also, so how can you be innovative again? Because in the 60s, what he did was, was really avant-garde, huh? or cutting edge signature. But how do you do that nowadays? And I have to tell you that in the competition, there were some very famous, every time you do competition, now we are facing uh, everyone, like Snoheta, Omar, uh, all the big superstars, my goodness. Um, and some of them proposed to, to make a new building here and so on. So we were very respectful. Who are we, you know, <laughs> to touch the, 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 the bin shaft. But we tried to, we proposed to explode the building from the inside. It's going to be there, but we're going to make holes and make lights coming because it's going to be brand outstanding, which is the highest standard you can have. And well, platinum, well, from the US, you know, and bring a greenery all over the buildings, open completely the ground floor and the basement to create a kind of super duplex with super common, et cetera. So instead of former way of using offices, it's going to be completely open all over. And now when you go in a bank, normally you come, you have to present your ID. It's like freeze, don't move, who are you? Here, the ID is the opposite. When you're going to go there in the future, within, you're going to be end of this year, actually. You're going to be welcome with the barista. Ah, do you want a coffee? Hello, welcome, etc. So it's completely an open house. That's a bit typically from uh, Holland. <laughs> Everything is open. So that's the idea. Um, and of course, they're going to have more uh, confidential zone. But that's the, the idea. We have going to have like 300, no, 3,000, up to four people working here. Uh, so they need a way. Why would you come back to work after the COVID? So that's really the idea. So you see here the, the duplex going down, going to the basement. That's a 3D. It's a render. How is going to be? And also because the, the the banker who did that project back in the days with Bunshaft, they also integrate, like uh, David Rockefeller did, that integrate art all over the building. So we can create a kind of, uh, from the inside, uh, it's completely open top to, to down, like uh, if you would be in a moment. So that's kind of a rendering with forum where everyone can meet, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the same batch of uh, iterative loop of uh, tools, um, but we use a bit more than just the static calculation of the PHP. There is a lot done with uh, the light uh, glare, the light autonomy, et cetera. All that is pretext how to open here and there all the buildings, because the idea is to have a very, very, very high end. Uh, comfort inside with natural lighting and so on. And then the management of um, of these mics of Thelma Bridge, I'm going to show you briefly. Yeah, that's uh, uh, pH design. That's uh, dynamic simulation, the IES. So all that is done in-house, of course. That's the rendering how it's going to be. Um, we use also because it's a building that has a kind of a layer. It's kind of a tranche milanaise like a cake where you have uh, hundreds of, uh, of uh, slices. Here we have 60 years of... Uh, of cabling elements, one on top of the other. So the, the augmented reality is very much used for the technique. So this guy here is one of the site uh, managers, site construction managers. It has nothing to do with high-end rendering, but they use that uh, augmented reality glove, you know, that you put. Uh, so that's something that we use more and more in projects. It's not, not yet like that. That's for movies like, uh, <laughs> I don't remember the one with... Uh, uh, yeah, from the film, uh, from a book from Philip Dick, but okay. So there is a lot of uh, attention done of how to bring uh, biodiversity, the water, which is managed on site, 100%, etc., etc., etc. et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera. Um, Solar panels and so on. But the thing is, I'm going to just show you one detail of the envelope uh, and one extra. So of course, it's all about how to manage this thermal brick because unless... All our friends from Build VC system that, and we were do, saying that years ago, you can live with miles of thermal bridge if you have no condensation and you have it heating and cooling demand uh, lower than 475. And then we don't care that we have thousands of thermal bridge. So, one of the ways we do it here actually, we trap it's kind of, of overlap. Here is cellulose, and above it's a wood, wood wall actually. We put a new uh, triple pane, and with that, the the 56 degrees, it's here, so we're never going to have condensation. Of course, you're going to have heat losses, but this is why on floor, on, on uh, the, the triple pane, is a very high uh, level of, of, um, of uh, uh, the, the R value. So you see here, the, it's almost over for all these thousands of windows that we had to do as it was in the 60s. 
um, and then you have the rice flow here and the connection that has to be um, airtight. So we use most for Klima, all the same products we have all over all over the world, actually. So there's no big deal. Come on, it's too easy. Now we put the, we have put the rice uh, floor and there's some trick because of course this project, even if it's huge, large scale, is going to cost uh, well, the building is over. We are working. Uh, site construction is started uh, a bit less than a year ago, but we are at exactly the same cost than a stupid renovation or a business as usual renovation. Absolutely no one dime more. And of course, it's a bank. They're not going to put more because it's passive house. No way. Or CO2 neutral. Come on, give me a break. It has to be or the same cost or cheaper, of course. And there are some tips and tricks. Uh, I can explain you some if you want. Then some very huge tips and tricks for that. Um, and of course, because it's so crazy, it's an enormous scale. So there is a lot of uh, tests that it's done uh, regularly every month of uh, according how far you are with the envelope with these, uh, sometimes just blower door, sometimes blower door with infrared, sometimes smoke and blower door, which is a very easy. And here you see that the, even the subcontractor who does that himself all along the, all along the, the site construction evolution. So that's one of the very easy way to make controls. And, and again, today it's normal. Every builder has that in-house. Um, so these openings, this is what we meant by, by opening all the buildings uh, top to bottom. So you see that's a picture took um, last month, actually. Um, these are all the forum all along. They're going to cross all the building um, just to have these kind of things uh, in a bank. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of like, uh, even you could be a co co-working actually. That's very funny for banks. Uh, the last thing I'm going to show you, it's a, it's a gadget. It's actually what we call the, the cheese on the cake. But when the cake, it's okay. You can start playing with some cheese. Uh, cheers. Uh, uh, yeah, the cerise, uh, cheers. So here it's, um, uh, we, do, we do need to um, clean the, all the concrete uh, elements that are outside since 60 years because we are in a deep zone in Europe where you have a lot of, of gas it's a bit like, like in, in, uh, in, uh, in downtown New York, <laughs> which is full of gas of NOx. So we use a treatment on the facade that it's, uh, we call that a photocatalyzer that cleans, that not only cleans the concrete, but also, uh, also gonna catch the NOx and uh, cut them and, and separate them into an, an, alley, an uh, salt. So you see the map of Belgium, that's Paris, that's London. So we are all on, on the fog, like in Manhattan, but okay, fine. And that's the zone. So it's really full of this NOx gas. So this building, when we say it's going to behave like a forest, is exactly like a forest. It's going to clean the air, strict or sensu. And again, that helps to increase the CO2 reduction yearly. So it, it's uh, close to 75%. And because of the scale of the building is as much as the forest of the size of the municipality where, where, where the building is, with only one building. This is the savings we're gonna, we're gonna have every year. This is why we say, again, another rendering. And now to end, we can say, yeah, it's cool because Brussels, you have the passive house code for everyone. It's like a local law. But um, and, and, and in our country, like, like your president, uh, that was two years ago, uh, when he said, I wanna be a uh, social neutral, Europe is going to be so neutral. We say, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, of course, of course. So this is how we are now since the passive house law came into effect. So we had a drop of CO2 emission of all the, the country. That's true. But to achieve CO2 neutral by 2050, we have to do more. And on the size of our region, we should retrofit two dwellings in passive house per hour, nonstop from now until 2050. And even if it's in the code, we are far from that. In New York, <laughs> New York, we have not we have a local law which is fantastic already, uh, but we should to achieve a, a New York CO2 neutral by 2050 retrofit at the minimum 15 dwelling or house per hour nonstop from now to 2050. So no way. This is why as that's quite in Tarantino, you know, we're far from from okay. That's the lack of oil worldwide because since the war everyone start wondering the US is here so. Anyway, <laughs> there is no more oil. I'm sorry. Same for Canada. Um, that's uh, Europe. And, and uh, we have Russia here. So one day or another, we're going to have to be fossil fuel free. Gas is not that good. In orange, it's still um, is what we call shale gas, which are very bad for the planet. So natural gas also comes to an end. That's the world um, resources we have, which is known and uh, unknown. So it means that whether we like it or not, 
we come to an end at the moment. And we should, to achieve a world which is going to be so to neutral by 2050, we should achieve a CO2 reduction worldwide of 5% each year. You know when it happens in our story, in the story of us all, it happens only three times. Last time was two years ago during the COVID. It means if we want to have a planet CO2 neutral in 2050, we, we should have the same impact than the COVID every year, nonstop until 2050. We are very far from that, very, very far. This is why we say, please, if you go to Passivos, first go beyond, but don't ask, just do it. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. That was fantastic. I want to say, I know some of the people in Massachusetts who came to see your work and uh, Passive House being code and being inspired by that, really everything in Massachusetts is just following you. And it's so encouraging to see you getting into the retrofit space and being the inspiration in that area as well. Do we have time for Q&A? Yes, we do. And uh, if everyone looks at the chat, you can see I've taken all the questions and, and put them into a lineup. So um, I assume you had no zoning dictated setbacks like we have in the States that might have prevented adding the exoskeleton, which is such a cool design on that first project. So yeah, what's going on in Brussels where you're allowed to just go another four or five feet off the building and and uh, impede into the to the to the air around the building? How does that work? The same, actually, it's the same all over. You know, we, we know that um, here we, when you see the the three D from the outside, you have a kind of step back, so we are surrounded by uh, let's say a, a few feet. So it was possible here to do a, a kind of an extra. This is why when I said in the beginning, sometimes you just can only uh, insulate from the inside, which is uh, tricky. You can manage it, of course. All the tools are there; they are available, so there's no, it's no big deal. But sometimes you cannot. So we have some other project where we had to do terraces and so on uh, on the inside because you could not even. And when you go to city center, it's worse because you have no, no zone where you can walk and so on. So you, you cannot go out of out they, of the. They own the land. The limit. Right? Yeah. They mm -hmm. own the land around it, so they could. Just yeah. build more. So Manon leads the uh, A2M office in, in New York, but it's the same story all over. And sometimes that makes problem for the first floor, let's say the ground floor, that you cannot properly insulate it. So you have to play with overlap between the, the first floor, it's insulated from the inside and from the second or the third, you, go, you start going outside. Then you have to overlap to cut the thermal bridge, yeah. No, that's great that that that's ha that, that property or that arrangement is, is is awesome. All right, coming back to uh, Patrick, um, Patrick, you're asking more um, a question, kind of what's happening here in Vancouver, BC, and we had some good comments for you from Bob and and from Carmel. But did you want to maybe rephrase that for Sebastian to see kind of how he was able to adapt? Yeah, I guess a uh, question for Sebastian would be what were the, uh, the sort of learning experience, especially early on in uh, either new build passive house or retrofit passive house in terms of uh, overheating? Uh, was that something that you experienced a lot early on in the process? And um, I guess lessons learned, I guess the exoskeleton, for instance, would solve a lot of those problems um, by just you know, having that sort of break uh, with uh, not getting as much uh, solar gain in the buildings to some extent. But yeah, interested to hear what the experience has been there. Yeah, overheating, it's uh, something we have to deal since, uh, you know, we did two embassy actually. We did an embassy in uh, Central Africa. Uh, it's a tropical zone, like 90% uh, of the year. Not only heat, but uh, it's uh, humid all, all year long. It's the same climate we have in New York in the summer, but here in, uh, in Congo, in Kinshasa, it's all year long. And we have another embassy, a passive house embassy in uh, Morocco. And it's the same overheating. But one thing we discovered since 2003 with the first uh, PHPPs, you know, <laughs> they were not as accurate than today, but they were already not bad. Uh, one thing we have faced that you, you, you can never trust 100%, you need to go a bit more uh, to dig it more. Is uh, you start with PHPP and then for comfort overheating, um, it's more accurate to use the dynamic simulation 
but you, you take all the result and the data from the PHPP, then you put it in the dynamic simulation, energy builder, no matter which, which software, and then you can test real scenario of, uh, of occupation, of density. Uh, and also since few years now, you know that we always do the, the check of uh, how it's gonna behave the building within uh, 40 years, 30 years, when we're gonna have uh, regarding the IPC scenario, when we're gonna have uh, 100 degrees, 110, what's gonna happen at that moment? And there are some tips and tricks. Of course, you know, it's Tarkus envelope, but that's never, never, never enough. So we always have to provide extra. And when you have the indication, yeah, th this is really worse. It's a bit more complicated. But again, it doesn't mean that you cannot do a full window. Um, yeah, so you have to go through this dynamic simulation. Then there is a lot of trick how to cool down, but only naturally, according to some climate, it's not possible. You're gonna need to demodify or to or to have an extra. I, I can just show you one one. Uh, just one image. I don't know if you can see that here. So you see oh, the no. image here. There it is. So, yeah. So that's a, a yearly uh, temperature that we had two years ago. So we, we wait the one of 2022. That's just in uh, two years ago. In uh, in blue, it's the worst case scenario uh, according to the IPCC two years ago uh, that we would have in 2050. So two years ago, in our part of Western Europe, I would say. Orange is what happened. So in orange, we had the same climate foreseen uh, that was foreseen in the worst case scenario, according to IPCC. And in the meantime, we had the heat wave from last year. So it's going to be even worse and worse and worse. But as I said, we, we have built uh, in, in tropical zone. Actually, I don't know, Belgium is, is a so small country, it's almost a joke. We have a building in the tropical bell. We start from Singapore, pass through Mexico and so on, and through Central Africa. So we've done a passive house there, but we've done also a passive house in uh, Antarctica, the South Pole. And there we had like a minus, it was a minus 110 degrees. It's one of the cold spawn on earth. So we say, coming from Belgium, look, if you can do it in both extreme climate, all the rest of the planet, I'm sorry, it's a piece of cake. Uh, I, I love that. You said that since years, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I I, gonna, I love that you have these experiences, so you can really have this really good discussion. Be like, we've done it everywhere. We can. We know Passivos works. Just, just amazing. Um, Bev, Bev, you're next in the queue. I'll uh, I'll give it back to you, and then uh, over to Sarah. So it's so awesome that triple glaze windows are just like standard now that Passive House is also standard. So not true here, and uh, I do know there's a lot of new entrants in the North American market in the triple glaze market, and costs have come way down, but I think I feel like people I know in Massachusetts are always scrambling to find what's out there and what's available. And I'm just wondering if anyone knows of anywhere, any organizations like maybe it's a Green Building Advisor or somebody else who puts together a list of those annually so that like we can see what's come that's new. Does anyone know about that? Why don't we fire those answers um, in the chat so we can keep going? Um, but again, it's a great question, and uh, you know, nothing like the accelerator team that we could have some more work and create, you know, some info. Maybe maybe it's another task for a potential intern. You know, source anyway. twenty fifty. Yeah, Thank you, exactly. Tom. The source twenty fifty. Make there, a plug. Does need to to bring as much as as we all can, so we're gonna help a bit. <laughs> Michael uh, Ingui talked to us about that. Uh, we, we, we talked about that last week. So that's the idea to try to bring, um, of course, there are always the cutting edge from Australia and uh, no, from Austria and from Germany. I love them all, but why, why pay three times the, the cost, please? Uh, yeah, you see, and there are so many products now that are there and for a third of the cost, please. So that's the idea to try to kind of bring massive uh, of this material. Thank you for your amazing presentation, your amazing work. Um, I'm curious how Passive House works with the code over there. Do you, is it a performance-based code, a prescriptive-based code? We're really trying to, you know, get Passive House into code over here, and there's a lot of efforts underway with ASHRAE, uh, with each individual state code. Um, are, do you have to submit a model when you apply for a permit? Does, do you have to pass your blower door to get the certificate, certificate of occupancy? Um, what modeling software? Yeah. Those kind of questions. 
So when Passivos has been integrated in, in, in the law, we, we first work with the, with the government who, who voted the law. So the minister asked uh, whether we adapt uh, all the European code, the EN is like ASHRAE. They're exactly the same with the same limit and some are, things are good and some things are really more than, a, well, I can say I'm from Belgium, Penny yes, yeah. So, but the thing is um, we need this code. For a moment, we discussed with Darmstadt, that was years ago, huh? before 2010, how to do it. Is it better to buy, like, I don't know, uh, 100,000 PHP and give them for free to everyone who want to apply any kind of building permit, like you have to do with local laws, which are normal? Or do we have to adapt uh, our ASHRAE, which are the European code? Do you have to adapt them and start uh, fighting with building physics, war with building physics, really? Whatever. So at the end, uh, it turned out that uh, we just took the code, uh, like the shrine you have, everything that you have to, to give when you, you, you do a building permit, you have to provide a calculation. And we changed a lot of, um, there's been a huge work between the code institutes, like the one here for the ASHRAE and, uh, and us, because I was at that time the head of the Belgian Passive House Association. So there's been a crazy work how to adapt part of the code because when it becomes it becomes the law it has to be for everyone accessible for everyone you cannot uh, help one more than another so it was um, some some part of the code has been uh, adapted sometimes it was just easy to just change the hypothesis because heat transfer uh, uh, it's it's all over the planet the same it's just some criteria that are changed uh, like uh, internal load and so on. So we had to adapt a lot of small uh, parts. It was really a harsh discussion, my God. It ended with just only experts and talking and no one understood nothing. This is why actually the law has been voted actually. And, and now, uh, the, when it came into effect, actually nothing changed. They just uh, adapt the existing law. It's just now the, you have to fulfill those 475 on calculation on paper. And um, there are random control as in, in every in every in every city on every uh, building department, like the DOB we have in Europe. So you have a random control, and if you cannot provide um, a, a blower dot test to match zero point six volume per hour, uh, you you have penalties and you have to adapt your building until if it it uh, is going to be okay. Of course, every time when low come into effect you have two three years of uh, cheating and and i don't know but the thing is the market is stronger that's the thing actually we, we discovered that huh? we, we had no clue idea of policy or how it works but the market is stronger when people cheat in large scale building or whatever at the moment they are becoming like black sheep etc cetera, etc cetera. so the market cleans himself itself i would say so actually it was no big deal and uh Unlike we hear all the time, and I was thinking it was a good thing that instead of training all the architects, all the builders, all the subcontractors, which is, which is a dream, it's fantasy, it, it's funny, it's cute, but you cannot train. We had we have eleven thousand architects. We have, um, I think, it's seven or eight thousand engineers in the country. You have twenty five thousand workers in the region. You cannot train everyone in, in four or five years. No way. So we didn't train. Not everyone, but just some one of them, and you had a kind of domino effect. And fine. And today, people who were against all that builders, architects, are still against. People who were endorsing continue to endorse. And in between, you have uh, like a consultant who helps. It's exactly like before. You could smoke even in an airplane. That's what I hear today. Who would smoke in an airplane? Yeah. And so what? There's no big deal. So it's a bit like like that. You see. There was no really, let's say, a revolution on the contrary. So all that for that, you see. Yeah, excellent. Okay, um, we're going to pause on questions. Kim, let's give us the update of what's coming up in the pipeline here for events. Great. Thank you, Sean. And thanks, everyone, for being here. It's great to see so many friendly faces. Uh, we have quite a few events to go over, starting with the podcast episode this week, episode 122. We have Jose Sosa, uh, architect and uh, CPHC. He speaks about um, 
the Latin American Passivau scene, his current move to London, and um, also uh, talks about the new 101 series, uh, which he is co-hosting, um, which I'll talk about in just a second. Next up, tomorrow, we have a Passive House Component Spotlight featuring Source 2050, closing the gap between specifying and sourcing. Uh, this starts at 1 o'clock Eastern, and I will put the registration link in the chat for you. Uh, next Wednesday for Construction Tech, we have the first uh, Construction Tech of the year, the Designer's Roadmap to High Performance HVAC. Uh, this is with Barry Price and Kramer Silkworth. Uh, we just did the run through for this on Monday and it was excellent. So hope to see you next Wednesday. Uh, coming up, we have Building Performance Interactive, our partnership, uh, produced in partnership with Partel. Um, coming back for season two this year. Um, episode one will be on January 26th. And the topic is offsite construction meets growing demand for better buildings. Next up, we have 10 steps to designing your first passive house. This is the first episode of our 101 series. Uh, many of you may recognize uh, Michael Ingley from Baxter Ingley Architects and the Accelerator will be giving a, a 101 presentation. And uh, Finally, just a reminder that the International Passive House Conference is taking place in Germany uh, in March, and they have extended their early bird uh, rate, I believe, let's see, until uh, the 22nd. So make sure to check that out. And I will drop all these links in the chat. Back to you, Sean. Excellent. Kim, some parting words for the first hour. Uh, just great to have everyone here. Um, great to have such a good uh, showing and Sebastian, thank you so much. It's been just such an honor to meet you and have you join us. Likewise, thank you. Bev, I'll give you the floor for we got like one minute. Any parting words from you, Bev? Let's get going on retrofits. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so that concludes our first hour. And again, with our new edition, we're going to do questions, but we're, uh, we typically would call it the, the uh, after hour, but uh, since we're kind of working on everyone getting back to work, it's going to be like 15 minutes. So I got to figure out a new title or so we need to figure out a new title for, for this second place. So if you do need to go back to work and carry on your day, we really appreciate you joining us today. Great to see uh, familiar faces. And again, uh, since I didn't get a chance to see you last week, happy new year to you all. Uh, and as we segue with this new time, I thought you guys appreciate that, uh, you know, when you do things and you just kind of realize like how either Canadian you are, American or European. This morning I played hockey, came home, got a coffee, had my Tim Hortons that has a hint of maple in it. And so, uh, yeah, I definitely am a, a Canadian uh, as these go. So I have to figure out my hockey schedule or shower quickly so I can get to these events on time. But I'm glad that you all did show up and uh, we still have a few more questions in the queue um but uh, we are on a bit of a timer because um we uh we do have to get back to uh the busy lives that we had so sebastian thank you for joining us um and mr peter molnair with his excellent spelling is hopefully still with us and he's got a question peter what are you great uh, topic sebastian thank you for your presentation um i was just wondering if uh since it became just an ordinary thing code level are all the uh, buildings still tested um, retrofit on new buildings for air tightness and uh, proper performance, or is it just uh, built that way and it's expected to work? No, all these buildings are tested, of course. And but, but the thing is, every builder now they have their own blower door test, and just to be sure that it's going to be okay in during construction doesn't mean that sometimes you have also control coming from outside, consultant to come. But again, some people continue to cheat as they're going to cheat always and fine. But again, as I said, the market is stronger. So some buildings didn't fulfill and they cheat, but these are buildings who, when you put on, on the market, let's say you have three uh, office buildings that you rent. Uh, in one of them, they all are, let's say, the pretend being passive house because it's the code, fine. But when you have a a lot of charge, like running costs, crazy running costs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then you, you start, these buildings are, uh, they are, you have vacancy because the people quit them. So you have a kind of uh, automatic regulation. You have that when you launch grade, you know, the grade that we have to 
for example, in New York now, you have to provide a calculation of the grade, where are you A, B, C, D, and so on. And, and the situation we have here now, buildings who have a grade higher than C or B, like uh, Ambada school, you know, um, they are gonna be, uh, they give uh, Europe, no, uh, Belgium give us a few years that you're not gonna be able to rent it or to sell it anymore. So you see, we, we are that far now. So it's not only the market, is that because there's no more other option. And it's funny because it was just like, uh, well, we should do that for, I don't know, environment or whatever, or dogmatic, eh, whatever. Here is now that just, <laughs> this is just no more choice. So the market regulates itself. You, you've seen that, uh, we see that all over. And some are still going to cheat a bit fine, but uh, mostly pff, not. Eh? So that's really, let's say, uh, it has nothing to do anymore to convince people or to make uh, or try to, it's uh, the market itself. <laughs> it's stronger, really. And you can imagine this building here, when it's going to be over now, every new build who is not going to be as far, CO2 neutral and so on. So people are going to say, but come on, what the hell? I put so many money for my uh, retrofit. And this one next door has a bill. You know how, how much they're going to save per year? We're talking about more than, well, I cannot say that officially, but it's going to be probably like $3 million a year of savings just with the situation of today, with gas, there's no more gas in Europe and so on. So you can imagine in a couple of years. So, and when you put a building nearby and the guy has a, a bill, which is 10 times that, what, do you, what, what, what you're gonna think is gonna happen. So the building is gonna be dead itself. So this is what helps. It's not only the regulation or the DOB who has to regulate and so on. As I said, there's always random control and we helped them years ago how to make control, how to be sure when you receive a file. And sometimes you receive a file which is so a mess that it's like you write, check me because I'm the bad. Come on, it's too easy. When you do certification, you know that. Huh? Certification is paramount when in an early market, you need yeah. that to have good example and so on and so on. But after a while, when it becomes mandatory, it's, it's, it has to come back to the administration, you see. Yeah, really interesting. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, just word of time, Sandra, over to you. Thanks uh, for your presentation, Sebastian. It was incredibly inspiring. I love the work that you're doing, especially all the different rating systems and standards that you're using to measure success on the project. And my question was about retrofits and the... Um, the payback and what I'm seeing in North America is that there are some uh, grants and incentives uh, for uh, organizations if they look at um, retrofits that have a 17 year payback or less and the energy prices are artificially low. Um, our federal government in Canada is offering low carbon economy fund grants, but the average price per ton in for the retrofit is $317 Canadian, which is absolutely almost nothing. <laughs> so what, what actually happens is that people do fuel switching and upgrades, but they don't touch the building envelope. And they're really leaving that for, for um, somebody else to fix later. And I'm just wondering, what are your um, paybacks looking, what's your cost per ton savings looking like in Europe and how does it compare to North America as a business case? Today payback is uh, zero minutes, zero hour after bidding is completed because uh, people don't invest if there is extra cost. That's no way. It doesn't exist. That That's in a dream. But years ago, before they launched the law, when the law has been voted, it was in 2011. Huh? But during five or six years, they did, um, we had a lot of incentive coming, um, not from government, not from municipalities, because no one has money, but it was actually, you know, when uh, energy is, 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 uh, is private, the same US, Canada, here is the same, mostly, not all of it, but mostly. So um, all these huge companies, energy provider pay small taxes to uh, to the county or to the, to the government. So actually the, what they did, the government, they take one tiny part of that tax to give it back to, can be whatever, you can do round point or, or streets, or you can give back money as incentive. So actually it's like uh, the tax we all pay 
you have a tiny part that comes back. But that it, it was nice only to accelerate the production of uh, beacon or showcases locally, not uh, abroad, but locally. That's the only effect that it had. And in, in a couple of years, we achieved like, um, it was crazy, uh, like almost uh, uh, 15 million square feet in, in a couple of years, thanks to this grant of taxes. But as soon as the law came into effect, everything stopped, no more grant, no more taxes, and no payback, because no one is going to invest. OK, I pay more, and I'm going to recuperate in two, three, five, ten 10 years. That, that's, um, we, we think it's the wrong message. But for that, you, you need help, of course. So some builders are, are more clever than us, really, and subcontractors. But Sean knows that. <laughs> He's the one. But uh, we have a hundred of Sean's like, here in Santa Maria. Um, and uh, there's always tips and tricks uh, how to be in a budget. For example, here the bank said, look, we're going to invest because we have to retrofit because we have no good condition to work anyway. So, And they were spread in few buildings. So they wanted to they sell uh, all the building and they, all the people are coming back to the headquarter. Uh, so they foreseen, let's say we're going to invest X amount. Print. So and it's only the choice. What are you doing that? Do you put, uh, I don't know, uh, granite, stone, uh, marble, uh, fantastic wood all over the place, which is super sexy, but no effect. Or you, you make a transfer or investment a bit more in the envelope and a bit less here. So, and they didn't ask passive or they didn't ask CCO to not They just said, look, we have 25,000 people who has to come back within two years in our headquarters. We have to retrofit to be with modern condition, comfort point, and then you're free. So we were the only one to propose, oh, come, come on, let's go to CO2. It's too easy, too easy on a large scale. But the other one didn't propose that. So it was up to everyone's choice to propose it or not. So you see, and because it's a bank, <laughs> of course, they're not going to put even one cent extra than what they have foreseen. The same if I would, I would do a house or, or retrofit, you, you have a budget and you have to manage in that budget. So one of the tricks we use, for example, to be in the budget, otherwise it's no way. Most of the building, when it's high an office building, you provide air, uh, electricity, data, whatever, on the on the uh, raised floor and in the suspended ceiling. So we said, look, we're going to pay one or another, but not both of them. So we decide no suspended ceiling, and everything is going to be on the floor. So we cut by two. Secondly, today, most most of the office building, as soon as you put uh, an artificial uh, lightings. It's already obsolete, I would say. So here we use dynamic uh, lightings, which work with the circadian uh, cycle, you know, uh, the temperature of, of light according to the version of the day, etc. For that, it's mm -hmm. easier to have lamps on, 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 on the table than on, on the ceiling. So we have put absolutely zero artificial lightings in all over the building. So in the half million square feet, there is no uh, lighting fixture anymore. Again, thousands of savings you, you cannot imagine that so again huh, it just transfer so of course we had some part of the windows were a bit more expensive because you had to fulfill the former design of bunshaft and the extra here we recuperated by savings here or there so it's the same job you do when you do when you want to do high design but you have a fixed budget okay you do i don't know something very sexy and you you save here so you see so payback there is no <laughs> that doesn't I would love to because we are paid on a percentage. So we would love to have extra cost, but unfortunately for us, there is no. <laughs> and sometimes it's a negative extra cost. We have some project, we end at 90%. Can you believe that? So it was a catastrophe for us, not for the client. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Great question. And you know what? Again, it's always nice to make sure that people are connecting. And sometimes you don't always see all the connections that happen on the uh, on the live events. But uh, glad that Luke and Sandra, I think there's some some good synergy between the two there. So that's great that Canada will gain some Eastern uh, some workforce in, in the policy department. Um, Michael Hindle had a question. I think Michael's left us, um, but I think it's we got about three minutes here. Sebastian, can you go back to the bank and do a bit of a deeper dive into the um, uh, thermal bridge material um, that you, or sorry, the insulation material you had at the uh, the window? Um, he the specific question was, um, what is the thermal break in the floors at the bank building? And I know the bottom insulation you said was cellulose. 
but the top part um just to kind of deep dive and and then we can kind of snip this because it's it's a really cool kind of detail so the so you have the triple pane window that you put in and again i love how you've saved costs because it's like one unit you put on every floor around and then you have insulation below the window and then you have a little piece of something above the slab what are some of those material choices right in there that's wood wall yeah because it, it comes with the the win window manufacturer so that's the typical triple pane glazing of course uh, that's membrane for air tightness we don't always use membrane sometimes it's, it's a painting which is an elastic painting yeah with, liquid applied air barrier yeah it's, uh, cost nothing but now everyone has that Ilbruck, uh, even uh, for Klima, so that's okay, no big deal, but you know that. So this part is gonna be done by the window manufacturer. It's, uh, okay. you can even see it on it. It's a uh, uh, wood wall. Here we use cellulose because in the drawing, it's a perfect um, structure, but in reality, it's like, my God, it, it's a mess. <laughs> I can't <laughs> say that to SM, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really a mess. So when uh, the idea here, we, we're gonna blow cellulose because we are sure we're gonna fill all the gaps and have no, never more than a half of an inch of vid to not have a, you know, a convection of air. Yeah, yeah. This plate cool. here under it, we put a small possibility of cooling and, and heating. It's uh, less than the 475 kBTU, so you know how it yeah. is, but it's maybe 10% of the year today, but within 20 years, maybe it's gonna be 15% of the year or 20% of the year when you see heat and cold wave we have, my goodness, we all have also have Arctic blast that you guys had the uh, one, one, one month ago. So, and this is part of the raised floor uh, subcontractors. So it's a mix of uh, cellulose because of the shape, which is, an, an, uh, well, it's a hell of a mess, my goodness. Yeah, it's not as nice this as is, You can manage because it's a, it's a dry, like dry wood construction. And then yeah. you can see it here. So you see, it's it's not it's not, and and again, uh, if if I don't tell you nothing, you would think okay, there's nothing and, and fine. So you see th that part here under it, yeah, that has been done. That's OSB, and uh, the tape is for uh, to be sure if there is leakage. There is no, but you never know. Uh, voila, and the uh, and the element here is going to be done by the window manufacturer as soon gotcha. as you're going to finish it. So slick, and again, just the fact so it, it's, it's a system. because that stupid design, it has to be as stupid as it can. Love it. All right, well, Sebastian, um, great detail. Thanks for that. It's nice that we can kind of snip and do and uh, take that just as great detail. I think, hey, Mark, it's one of those ones where uh, we do our construction tech, we can just say, hey, Sebastian uh, could fly in virtually because we've already got a good five minute segment there. Um, Sebastian, we could always have you back again. You, you, we didn't get to a lot of the tips and tricks, um, but again, having 12 years worth of, uh, of building passive houses and uh, it's again, the experience of your team there is amazing. And, and again, I'm, I'm sure uh, the, the passive house network in New York loves you, having your team as well, just to, to be able to be a bit of a sponge of stuff that you guys have been up to. So great stuff. Um, I think maybe, uh, and again, we got to, put a new name to this section. Uh, maybe we call it the final countdown after after we do our live event because it's fast and furious and um, time's up. We got to get back to work and back back to our lives. So Sebastian, uh, thank you very much for having us. Um, again, always appreciate uh, the insights and the passion and just the determination that Brussels did to be a, a beacon of change in the world. So thank you for, uh, for all that you've done. And uh, all I have to say is everyone just keep building better. Zach, do you want to, uh, or Kim, do you guys want to hit the clock and get us back to work or any final words you guys need to say? Well, just incredibly inspiring, Sebastian. Thank you so much for all of your work and for sharing it with us. And thanks everybody for being here.